What's up, everybody, and welcome back to our Top Cut broadcast of the Women's Tournament number two. I am Rosemary Kelly, joined by Gabby Snyder. It is so good to be commentating with you again. We already had some great calls made by Lou and Regina for the beginning part of Top Cut, but we're closing things out with the grand finals now, Gabby. I know, and it's been such a hype road to get here i mean those top four matches were absolutely insane so shout outs to everybody who's made this tournament happen i mean all of the mods all of the people running tech behind the scenes you are all absolutely incredible we love you all thank you chat for being such a positive uh environment throughout all of this excitement but it is time to finally play through the grand finals after we answer the VGC question of the day, Rosemary, what's your favorite VGC format? My favorite VGC format is the format that I started in because that holds a very near and dear place <laughs> to my heart. And it's VGC 2014 where Scarf Tyranitar was a rampant and I love it. That's definitely my favorite format. And I also think that ages me quite a bit. But uh, what's your favorite format, Gabby? <laughs> I mean, honestly, mine is 2015. So I am right there with like the aging you part. Uh, not because it was my first <laughs> format, but because it was the format that I qualified for Worlds in. And it just had such an incredible year. I met so many amazing friends. I'm pretty sure that was the year you and I met That's for the, the year first that time. we met. And I was yeah. going to say. And I remember looking up to you as a player, oh as a competitor, as a woman in this space. And the fact that we get a chance to work together now means the entire world to me. And I Likewise. think I'm actually going to make myself cry uh, talking oh my about God. this as we were I trading know. stands in chat. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, I, I literally just said I'm going to cry on stream, but like it, it really sorry. is incredible. I'm not sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I'm not I, sorry I honestly... for supporting you. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's also been incredible to just you know watch your journey throughout vgc and throughout commentary as well so you know i'm right there looking up to you maybe we can just look up to each other and just like take off to the moon uh but we'll have to do that after this finals because i i think that we have a amazing match to to, to cover to, that's ahead of us and i'm so so excited um let's take a moment to look at the top eight bracket to see what these trainers have had to face in order to get here to it the finals. It was a long journey. It was a long journey because we had quite a few best of three matches take place over the course of Top Cut today. But you can see a little bit of the, the sprites on screen for the teams that these amazing players were running. Um, and now we're at the point here where we are at the grand finals where it's going to be Malcolm versus Elisa. And so I'm super excited to see how this is going to match out because, of course, when you're taking a look at the restricted Pokemon on either side of the field, We've got Groudon versus Zacian. It's not something you get a chance to see every day. It, it's not something that I think we've seen, um, at least not in this tournament. I, we could have seen it day one, but honestly, I that's been so long ago, I don't really remember. But it's certainly an interesting matchup on paper, you know, looking at these teams and looking at um, how these restricted Pokemon pair up against each other. You don't really want to bring a, Z a Zacian to a Groudon fight. Like, <laughs> it, you, you can do some damage. You know, Behemoth Blade is always going to be a insanely powerful attack, especially when the Pokemon on the opposing side of the field is Dynamax or Gigantamax. But uh, still, it, it's not going to have much of a, an advantage to a Pokemon that gets super effective ground and fire type attacks. So I'm really curious to see how Malcolm is going to approach this matchup because on paper, I feel like they're mm -hmm. at just a slight disadvantage if only because of the restricted Pokemon on the field. Yeah, I would assume the same as well, especially when you are taking a look at Zacia needing to kind of reposition to get off that big damage versus a Dynamax or a Gigantamax Pokemon. And unfortunately, I just don't feel like there's going to be very many opportunities to get those safe switches in. I think that's something that you might want to consider is definitely bringing Rillaboom to this matchup, except yes. you do have a little bit of that kind of struggle against that Charizard if you're going to get caught by something like the G-Max Wildfire. So I think this is definitely a game where we're going to see a lot of intelligent switches come through and particularly from Malcolm's side. 
Yeah, and it's also like two different play styles being matched up against each other. We've seen from Malcolm's previous games that they prefer to play a little bit slower. You know, they mm -hmm. prefer to switch around to take advantage of all eight of the turns that Light Clay G Max Resonance gets you. Uh, whereas Elisa started her games off very aggressively in top four. You know, we saw that Charizard and Didi combination with the helping hand, the Max Airstream, the G Max uh, Wildfires coming out left and right. And it's really going to be up to Malcolm, I think, to respect that style of play and, you know, yeah. change their approach accordingly. Because when somebody is running that offensive and has access to that much literal firepower right off the bat, <laughs> um, you have to be very careful and make sure that you approach it, um, you know, as safely as possible. You know, I hard to agree with that. Yeah, to their benefit, I, you know, Incineroar plus Lapras it can set up G-Max Resonance, you know, fairly easily. We have not seen the reveal of any grass type moves on that Charizard. So you may not have to worry about a G-Max Overgrowth to pick up that knockout. Um, but it's still going to be a bit of an ask. So um, I'm so excited for both these trainers. You know, congratulations for making it this far. I think that both of them have a ton of people cheering both of them on in chat, which is super duper hype. So um, once they're ready, we're going to get this match up and going. So. Oh, I'm, ah, so I'm just exciting. so excited. I know. I know. <laughs> ah, grand finals hype always gets me super hype, especially when it is a championship Sunday is what we're looking at right now. And from both of these players that are in the grand finals, we are going to have a new champion this time around for the women's tournament. Um, so I think that's something that's really exciting to me is that we've been able to see a lot of different trainers rise to the occasion throughout the course of these last two days. And a lot of players that have never done a tournament before already seeing some incredible results from them. And it's really great to see all of the support for this event in the community as well. Yeah, and also so many people are have been sharing their team codes on Twitter yeah. like immediately after they're done with the tournament, which has been absolutely incredible. So if you see a team that you liked, chances are it's already been posted. I mean, Lauren from the last round, uh, I think, posted her team immediately after she was done. So if you want to go try out that Naganado for yourself, it's there. It's <laughs> out there. You can just go to your Switch right now while we're waiting for these trainers to get going um, and set yourself up for some fun action. So thank you to all the players who are doing that. You know, I was talking about this re with Regina earlier, but team codes have really made the game so much more accessible. So to be able to try out these teams and have fun with them so close to the tournament itself is really exciting. I mean, hey, I'm using one of your team codes right now, Gabby. That Tornogre team is doing me quite a bit of good on the ladder right now. So if you got a chance to see that on your screen, you may as well try to check that out. Also check out Gabby playing it, you know, things like that. Um, but it's been really, really awesome to see the incredible support for every player that has performed in this tournament and also seeing the camaraderie around the fact of sharing out those team codes for other people to try, especially if you have been on stream and there are definitely people that want to use your team. So it's really great to see people behind that support. So I'm super excited, but we're about to get right into this grand finals action. It's Mogar, it's Elisa. You guys tell us in chat who you are voting for to win the grand finals and to take it all home. Thank you so much to Top Cut Events for sponsoring our Top Cut coverage as well as supporting these players that are in Top Cut with prizes. Uh, we've got some plushies and some play mats that are going to be going to, <laughs> I, I think, some of the Top Cut winners, which is really, really fun. And there might be some Pokemon packs thrown in there. Uh, we'll Ooh. see. So, yeah, some good stuff coming all of these trainers' way, but we have to crown a champion. Champion. Yeah, so again, good luck and have fun. The players have entered team preview. So once again, just to do a quick rundown of the teams, I believe Mogar will be on the bottom of your screen and they are running a Lapras and Zashin. And Elisa will be running a team of Umbreon, Groudon, Indeedee, Porygon 2, Charizard, and Kartana. So one very firepower heavy team versus one good dog. Um, 
maybe even the goodest dog in the tournament right now, especially after <laughs> it took all HP. those attacks. <laughs> One so HP insane. earthquake. I'm still reeling from that, but I'm so, so hyped for these finals. We've got, like you said, uh, I thought you were going to stop it with the puns, Gabby. Jeez. Uh, oh. But the firepower on, <laughs> on Elisa's side versus the, the you know, more defensive oriented style of play that Mogar has been using this entire tournament. So, I'm very curious to see if there are going to be some adjustments to that game style, that game plan, and who's going to come out on top. We are still playing a best of three, meaning that these trainers that are competing need to get two game wins in order to take home the championship. And since we aren't playing in a double elimination bracket, that means there's no bracket reset. Whoever gets is the first to two will take this ho game home, take the set home, and take the tournament home. So and, I'm yeah, super pumped. I'm super pumped too. And it's also closed team sheet, which means it's possible that there's still some secrets on both of these teams that have yet to be revealed. I know that we've seen Mogar on stream a couple of times at this point, but I feel like, especially if you're running a team as, um, I guess weak to grout on as uh, Zashin and Lapras can be. You have to have some tricks, especially on there for this matchup. So I'm hoping we'll see them revealed on this stream. And I mean, talk about creativity, Elisa's team. There's a lot of similarities to a 2019 team that did very well at the World Championships, but uh, she did a great job of putting her own spin on it. I hope that we get to see that Umbreon one more time. And there it is right on the field at the beginning so let's go <laughs> all right get a chance to see an evolution right off the bat plus we also have the porygon 2 that is going to be on elisa's side of the field but for mocha's side we can see the raichu which is one of their most favorite pokemon alongside that landorus which is going to get the intimidate drop onto both but elisa doesn't have too much to worry about from that front yeah, very interesting start from Elisa. I don't think I was personally expecting her to start off the game so slowly. You know, we saw the Porygon 2 and the Umbreon close out a game for her in the top four rounds of this tournament. But to lead the two together, to me, implies that she was assuming uh, Malcolm would start off a bit slower, but gives Malcolm the perfect opportunity to send out the Zashin before we see that Groudon, before we see that Charizard, really before we see see any of the Pokemon that threaten it. Yeah, it is good to have the Zacian set up here because now you get a chance to to kind of get set up here, except Umbreon's going for a yawn. So Zacian may not feel as safe to click those sword stances that we've seen before as it sits on the field, unless you want to Dynamax that Raichu and get the, you know, electric terrain on the field. I don't think that's going to happen. So I think we're just going to see some switches come through. Yeah, I mean, as much as I would love for a read that deep, it's early on in game one. I think you have to play a bit more <laughs> conservatively, unfortunately. Uh, but that would have been super hype. Unfortunately for Zashin, I don't think we... Actually, we did see the Yawn revealed from Umbreon at some point in the past, but uh, really safe switch, a really safe call by Elisa there. You know, even if that uh, Landorus was going to stay out on the field, putting the Landorus to sleep would have also helped a potential Charizard later on in this game well after the vault switch here that raichu is going to back go back into its pokeball malcolm is going to set out a different pokemon in its place which is going to be the zacian that we saw go back into its pokeball just moments before um now we have the intrepid sword giving that zacian a plus one attack boost as umbra goes oh. for the yawn again <laughs> a huge call there by elisa yeah, and even though the Incineroar and the Landorus are switching in and out, those Intimidates aren't going to make a difference when both the Umbreon and the Porygon 2 on Elisa's side of the field are going to be attacking either with Malcolm's own firepower thanks to the foul play or just special with that Ice Beam from the Porygon 2. Uh, so a unfortunate spot for the Zashin. It's looking for that opportunity to go for, I'm assuming, those Behemoth Blades to deal big damage to the Porygon 2 or the Umbreon, but it's just not going to find that opportunity as long as Umbreon keeps yawning. No, uh, now we're going to get a chance to see that Incineroar go for that Darkest Lariat right into the Porygon 2. Not doing too much damage, but Umbreon is just continuing to click that Yawn button. But what better Pokemon to take that than the Raichu that's sitting on the field, knowing that it has the ability to switch out with that Volt Switch? 
Yeah, and it will have the opportunity to switch out, but thanks to the Trick Room going up, it's going to be the last Pokemon to move on the field. And I just find this very, a very interesting start from Elisa. Very, very different from her previous round on stream. You know, I, it's really uh, interesting to note that there hasn't been much damage down onto the field. Uh, Porygon 2 could certainly keep chipping away with those ice beams, you know, maybe try and find a freeze here or there. But uh, I think the slow play is really benefiting Malcolm because they have these opportunities to get the Zashin out onto the field. And every turn that Umbreon is clicking Yawn is a turn that it's not really attacking. So if Incineroar is able to find a knockout somehow in here, maybe even five, six, seven turns down the line, I think it will eventually benefit them more. Ooh, but foul play though, not super effective, but it is going to bring Zacian to about half as we do see the Incineroar go for the parting shot as we saw selected during that move selection process. Uh, but what's coming out in its place? It looks like it's going to be the Raichu once again, just to help to continue to pivot. But the foul play coming out from Umbreon means that Zacian's not going to get yawned this turn. So that might be a huge win for, for Malcolm there. Zashin will still move after the Umbreon, so it's possible that the Umbreon could yawn it this turn, but this might be that one attack that the Zashin was looking for. Uh, if it's mm -hmm. able to hit hard and hit, maybe not first in the turn fast, but hit at this moment in time, uh, this could definitely be the uh, change in pace that Malcolm's been looking for. Yeah, helping hand to help out the damage coming through from that Zacian, but we do see the Ice Beam connect onto the Raichu first, as Zacian is going to be one of the slowest moving Pokemon on the field, thanks to that Trick Room. Yawn does come out from the Umbreon, but is this enough? Let's see the Sacred Sword, how much damage it's gonna do. That Umbreon gets taken right down to its Focus slowest no. little bit of HP. It's a total <laughs> <lied>. leftovers. <laughs> yeah, it's not a Focus Sash, it's an invisible oh one God. for sure. It's almost like Umbreon had a second item. That is absolutely insane. And that has to be something that that Umbreon has been trained for. So it's nice because I think the Raichu will be able to pick up the KO with the Volt Switch here. So as long as the Sashin doesn't fall asleep this turn, that Umbreon's probably yawned its last yawn for the game, but uh, still applying that consistent pressure to Malcolm on the opposing side of the field may be a great opportunity for this Groudon to uh, start getting into the field position that it wants to threaten that Zashin as well. Yeah, wow, that is a <laughs> huge survival there for that Umbreon, though, because now we can continuously still maybe either go for some damage here or continue to go for a yawn, but Groudon is now out on Elisa's side of the field, or it could just use Moonlight here. It's just going to heal off all of that damage. Yeah, you know, I I feel like I might have commentated Curse this game just because I said that it was going to be fast versus slow, but oh, Elisa just showing... Analysis how flexible her play style is. That paralysis on the Umbreon could certainly throw a wrench in her plans because it may cause the Umbreon to, you know, uh, I not really flinch, just be unable to move and get those yawns down on the field. But, you know, more importantly, I think that it's, it's still in a position where it's forcing Malcolm to keep switching. Uh, now that the Groudon has been revealed from Elisa, I think these switches might be a little bit more in Malcolm's favor because they did bring both the Incineroar and the Lander Asterion. They can easily switch in and out and just cycle those Intimidates over and over and over again to weaken the Groudon on the opposing side of the field. But if you think about it, as long as the Groudon is in play and as long as that uh, Zashin is still something that Mo uh, Malcolm has to be careful about, uh, it's going to be a very tough position for uh, Malcolm to navigate. I mean, this is going to be a tough position for both of these players, right? Especially because you already yeah. mentioned that there's like the, the double Intimidate on the team where you do have Landorus as well as Incineroar. But Elisa is smartly playing around both of these Pokemon being on the field. Takes out the Groudon to bring in Porygon 2 while Malcolm switches in that Landorus. Uh, but we are going to see a huge knockout with a critical hit. Oh, oh man. my gosh, it's Umbreon. And, and that's why Umbreon is such a fantastic 
Pokemon to bring in these restricted formats. Foul Play uses your opponent's attack power to determine the amount of damage the move will deal. So Umbreon, free to invest in as much HP or defenses as it desires, can still go for those heavy hits. I think that critical hit definitely mattered, but the fact that Malcolm is now down to only one Intimidator and is forced to bring their Zacian back out onto the field is a very tough spot for them to be in. Ah, uh, something tells me these Umbreon stonks might be rising. Many of us might want to get your uh, trades in soon, chat, because Umbreon looks like it is absolutely busted. That paralysis not hurting it at all yet, as we are going to see a couple more switches come through, as that Landorus did get taken out by that foul play. So now it's Raichu on the field here. Yeah, fortunately, Raichu, we could see it go for another helping hand with that Zasha, and Trick Room just expired, so it will get the opportunity to attack, but the question is, which Pokémon do you target to lock down your win condition? And picking the Porygon to me, oh, you just oh no. barely miss out on removing Trick Room from the field, which really is Malcolm's goal at this point. The Groudon is so much more comfortable in Trick Room uh, than the Zacian or the Raichu ever will be. And Umbreon and Porygon too, as well, with that Moonlight combination and the, I'm assuming the Porygon too <sighs> must have access to recover. I think yeah. Elisa has found herself a way to just keep healing and uh, really uh, taking advantage of the fact that Malcolm is forced to wait out these trick room turns before Zashin can do much of anything. Yeah, I mean, we still haven't even seen a Dynamax yet, Gabby. I know. This is a game that has been very, very slow to play because of the repositioning necessary. And even Zacian doesn't want to stick around anymore, maybe hoping that Groudon's going to switch in here, maybe expecting that, like, Zacian might be taken out. Like, it's it's kind of tough call what Malcolm can kind of do in this situation, but Umbreon does get paralyzed for this turn, but Porygon 2 goes for the recover. As you called, there are two recovering moves on this team for Elisa, as we saw in that Moonlight and that Recover, but the Nuzzle comes through. Porygon is now paralyzed as well. I almost feel like Malcolm is forced to Dynamax their Incineroar at this point in time. I, or maybe the Raichu, you know, maybe now that you're... Uh, I think the preferred Dynamax target for Malcolm was going to be that Lander Astherian, but now that it's been knocked out, maybe you just go for the Dynamax on Raichu, set up that electric yeah. terrain, and <laughs> know that, yeah, I won't be able to knock out the Umbreon to stop it from yawning, but at least now I know that my Zacian, when it does get the opportunity to hopefully attack after these five turns of Trip Room, are over uh it won't be put to sleep but still a very very flexible play from elisa i love how she's matching malcolm's team almost move for move and taking advantage of uh, just how much the game has slowed down Another foul play coming up from Umbreon here. Not going to be enough to knock out the Raichu, but the parting shot hits its mark. Malcolm correctly calling the switch and will be able to drop the attack and special attack of that Groudon before going back into its Pokeball. But Zacian now kind of in a position where it really doesn't want to be, which is going to be in front of that Groudon. I wonder if Malcolm knows how many Intimidates or how many attack drops need to be connected with that Groudon in order for Zacian to be able to uh, take a hit at this point in time. It looks like with the Volt Switch, we'll be seeing that Incineroar return to the field. So Groudon on Elisa's side of the field will be at minus two. And we saw the Precipice Blades in the top four match. Maybe minus two Precipice Blades is it can be survived by the Zacian at this level. It's it's so hard to say, but if Malcolm is able to find an opportunity to go for a Behemoth Blade or a Sacred Sword here uh, to maybe try and... I, I feel like you still have to target that Groudon somehow because it's such a mm -hmm. big threat. Um, it, maybe that's how you find your win condition here. But as long as Elise is able to keep switching and as long as she's able to, you know, ensure that the Groudon will be able to attack eventually, I, I think Malcolm is just in a really really tough spot. Malcolm certainly seems like they are under a little bit of pressure here when it comes to maneuvering around this Groudon, but 
it, the Groudon is at minus two, like you said. Parting Shot has been clicked, so it's possible that the Parting Shot can come through. But look at this. It's time to Dynamax here. It's been a little bit since we've seen a Dynamax for these games. We're still in game number one, and we still haven't seen a Dynamax, but it is going to be that Groudon that Dynamax is for at least a side of the field. Now that's telling me that there's a lot of damage that could potentially be coming out here. Maybe even, you know, trying to get some of those boosts but oh boy umbreon going for the foul play here right into the zacian not able to take it out but this parting shot is going to help quite a bit yeah and i think malcolm's making the best play that they can make at this point in time which is get again attack drops down on that groudon and hope that zacian has enough health to take the impending max quake i I'm a little bit skeptical after that foul play. I, I feel very unfortunate for the Zashin, though. It it has survived some incredible attacks. Ugh, I, just this wasn't one of them. it's not going to take this one. No, that is going to be a super effective Max Quake that will deal the last little bit of damage necessary to knock out this Zacian. And now you're... If you're Malcolm, I feel like you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. You've got Incineroar, you also have the Raichu, I believe, and what do you Dynamax here? I, <laughs> I, I'm not even sure if Dynamax would necessarily help Malcolm at this point, unfortunately. Incineroar, if they go for Max Flare, it's not going to do much damage to the Groudon or the Umbreon because they're on the bulkier side. And mm -hmm. if anything, you set up the sunlight for those moonlights again. If you Dynamax the Raichu, you can stop the Yawns, but like, is that even a threat at this point in time? I, I think that, unfortunately for Malcolm, the best thing that they can do is click in that early forfeit. You know, there's still some information about their Raichu and their Incineroar that we don't know and keep that information secret going into game two. I find it very interesting that they decided to bring the Zashin into this matchup to begin with. You know, I really do like how the Zashin matches up against the Porygon 2 and the Umbreon. Uh, it's just unfortunately was not able to find the opportunity to really get that to play out. And even when it did, missing out on that KO on that Umbreon by just a sliver of health. Going into game two, if that's your plan, I think you have to stick with it, but maybe, like you said, Dynamax that Raichu. Get that electric terrain down on the field so you don't have to switch every single time Umbreon goes for a yawn, and then you can afford to hit it two or three times. Um, but then you're using your Dynamax on a Raichu, which you have to think, like... It's not the most optimal Pokemon to Dynamax, but on a Zacian team, and you're not bringing your Gigantamax Lapras, like, what else would you Dynamax? That's kind of the question here. If you're not going to bring it, then uh, you, who knows? But I like this uh, start from both of these players here. You've got the Porygon 2 and the Umbreon again for Elisa, but you do also have the Zacian and the Raichu for Malcolm. And now this is kind of where I feel like maybe you can... It, it's possible to click Sword Stance here. Uh, you could also go ahead and go for some damage. I. The moves honestly came in so fast, I couldn't see what Malcolm actually selected to do. <laughs> it was Sword Stance, which is a good opportunity for the Zashin, but if the Umbreon went for a foul play instead of a yawn, uh, it would have been it would have taken so much damage that could have possibly been a knockout. So now Malcolm, if they decide that they want to keep the uh, the Sword Stance <gasps> boost, I, we're, I think we're going to see <gasps> the big Raichu, which I... <gasps> I, I don't know, because this could potentially mean you're trading your Zashin for a knockout on the opposing Porygon 2. And with the Dynamax uh, Raichu <laughs> in the equation as well, I, I'm not sure if that's a good trade. I, I don't know how these stonks work out, unfortunately. <laughs> I think this trade works out quite well for Malcolm. I know chat's really excited about this. I'm super excited about Big Raichu. And I feel like it really speaks to the prowess of, of Malcolm as a player with Raichu as their partner. And this Max Lightning is going to do enough to knock out this Porygon 2 and also stop Zacian from falling asleep to that yawn. We'll have to see how much damage the foul play is going to do in yeah. to the Zacian at this point in time. I'm assuming that Elisa saw uh, the possibility. Yep. So here we go. 
All right, Ooh. it's not very effective. And thankfully that is enough to ensure that Zashin will be around for another turn. It's important to call out the fact that it looks like that is a two hit knockout onto that Zashin, but it's not asleep. It has the plus two attack and whatever Pokemon is going to be coming in on Elise's side of the field. I, you have to imagine that it's going to be the target of Zashin's attack this next turn. It, it's not gonna I, I don't think that umbreon is as big of a threat right now given that it can't put those pokemon to sleep that was so key to elisa's strategy in game one you know trick room is gone you have to assume that malcolm has the incineroar and the landorus again in the back of their party um it, it's uh, so much better and it's all thanks to our friend raichu <laughs> Thank you, Raichu. Thank you for giving us such a fantastic match so far. And thank you, Umbreon, because Umbreon has been a real MVP of Elise's team. Uh, we'll see if it's able to survive through some of these attacks coming through from this Raichu. Obviously, Raichu is not going to be able to hit the Groudon. Uh, Behemoth Blade trying to go for the Groudon, but... It gives, I think, Elisa a little bit of time to think about exactly how she wants to play around this game because uh, they were able to see that it was going to be that Behemoth Blade, but Zacian's going to get knocked out. What a smart protect coming through from Elisa to be able to secure the knockout onto that Zacian and ensure that that Dynamax is going to be safe. Yeah, but on the off chance that the Groudon did decide to Dynamax that turn, that Behemoth Blade would have been crazy hype thanks to the fact that it does double damage to any Dynamax Pokemon. So even though the, Z the Zacian gets KO'd by the Umbreon there, I think that's okay. I think you take that risk on the off chance you catch your opponent being maybe a little bit too comfortable with the board state and just going immediately for that big damage. Um, I really do like that play, even if, again, it did result in the Zacian being knocked out. And now that the Zacian has been removed, I think that Malcolm is in a great spot to start getting those Intimidates down onto the opposing Groudon and really punishing if it if it does decide to go for that Dynamax. So a really, really key position for Malcolm to be in, even though they lost the Zashin and are forced to play a bit slower with the Raichu and the Incineroar once again. Um, I think they have way more offensive presence than they did back in game one. I would agree with that, but huge precipice plates here. Raichu oh. avoids the attack though. So it's just gonna be Incineroar that takes that damage bringing it down to its berry. So we'll be able to heal up some of the health there with that Citrus Berry. But here is the Flare Blitz. Now that's going to be doing a lot of damage here. Will be enough to knock out that Umbreon. But wow, I, I, that is, that's been a problem. That's been a problem for Malcolm. They've removed the problem that was that Umbreon. Yeah, and they did it before the electric terrain ran out, which I think is the most important thing to know. And we finally get to see Elisa's last Pokemon, since I don't think we got that in game one. It's going to be the Charizard, so still still something to be afraid of, still a threat. But with Raichu still on the field, and you have to assume that Landorus Therian in the back, uh, a position that Malcolm can easily uh, handle. Now, the big question, I think, for Elisa is which Pokemon will she Dynamax? I almost say you... Dynamax, or should I say Gigantamax, the Charizard here, uh, knowing that it will be a little bit faster, it will be able to hit harder, and thanks to the Gigantamax, we'll most likely be able to take a Volt Switch from that Raichu, but uh, more Paralysis going down on the field first. That is going to be key moving forwards in this game. It really is. Groudon is going to connect both of the Precipice Blades, though, this time around, which is going to bring Raichu down to its Focus Sash, but knock out this Incineroar more importantly. However, that does give Malcolm a free switch now into that Landorus that's going to be in the back, but Charizard just goes for the Heat Wave here, which is going to be enough to knock out that little sliver of HP that Raichu had left from that Focus Sash. That is a really... Uh, interesting play from Malcolm there, but a great play from Elisa to force them down to their last Pokemon. Landorus as the last Pokemon is certainly an interesting choice because it can hit the Groudon and the Charizard super effectively. It can use Rock Slide to go for those flinches. It can go for an Earthquake depending on which Pokemon that Malcolm thinks is the bigger threat. 
I think you have to prioritize the Charizard just because of those sun boosted, solar power boosted heat waves. Those are going to be so, so powerful. And knowing that the Groudon has been intimidated a couple of times and won't be able to use Press Swiss Blades as his primary form of attack, I think you just have to hope that you can take the couple of fire punches thrown your way and you can bring yourself into a game three. Wow. Well, it is going to be the Landorus moving first with that Rock Slide, doing enough to be able to knock out the Charizard. But Groudon <gasps> greedily goes for a sword stance here, wants to be able to really make sure it's going to be dishing out some big damage against this Landorus. So you have to wonder how much bulk this Groudon has invested in it. If it's able to take an Earthquake at neutral attack in the sun, um, I don't think this Landorus is the Assault Vest variant. You know, it's going to be taking a ton of damage from that Fire Punch. And it's, again, it's just going to come down to, uh, to some damage rolls. If Earthquake is able to pick up the KO on this Groudon in one hit, that's obviously going to be a GG for Malcolm. But we've seen this Groudon take a few precipice blades even uh, in mm -hmm. previous rounds you have to assume that it's going to take a couple of those attacks so a very tough decision do you try and get more chip damage down on the field do you try and stall out the sun maybe depending on how many turns are left in that or do you just go for that big attack and hope for the best I mean, here's one way to deal with one of those Dynamax turns. Groudon is going to be moving second, I believe, on this field. And so you yep. saw the Landorus go for Fly, which means that it is going to be out of the way of a big attack coming through from this Groudon. But Groudon, as Elisa has smartly saved the Dynamax up until now, after the Swords Dance, shh, is, is hoping to seal out the game here with those last couple of moves that were selected. Yeah, so most likely we'll see this grout, this Groudon go for something like a Max Flare. Again, you have to assume it's going to be boosted. Uh, well, maybe not this turn, but eventually by the sunlight that it'll bring back out onto the field. And the big question is, can Landorus take this attack? We're about to find out, and if Landorus cannot, we will have a new champion. Max Rockfall now coming through from the ground on onto the Landorus, and with that boosted attack, is it going to be enough? Pixels deceive me, but it kind of looks like Landorus Hail hung on there. It, it did, it did. And now Landorus has the opportunity to go for a second fly. And you have to assume that that max rockfall came from a rock slide. The big question is when Landorus returns to the ground, will that rock slide hit? And if it does, will it do enough damage to pick up the knockout? Because if not, an earthquake here is going to be absolutely key. It is just down to the wire. Wow. All oh, right, man. we'll see what happens here. Landorus going for the fly now. We saw how little damage it did to the Groudon in its Dynamax form. Oh, Landorus oh, but the gets life orb. To seven. And Groudon is going to be able to get healed up here by the berry that it has held, which is that Citrus Berry. Rock Slide does connect here. It is going to be able to do enough to knock out this Landorus. And Elisa becomes our new Women's Tournament Champion going from second place in the previous women's tournament to taking the crown this time around. Congratulations to Elisa. Congratulations to Mogar as well. They played absolutely incredibly in what was a very tough matchup. You know, they were looking for those opportunities to get those intimidates down to match the slow play that Elisa just was so comfortable with that Porygon 2 and that Umbreon. But uh, Elisa, again, taking the win after missing out just barely in the first women's tournament. Congratulations. That that must feel so good right now. Yeah, the fact that, you know, you get a chance to see some of that improvement from women's tournament one to women's tournament two, getting a chance to take the whole thing home. That's super, super exciting. But we saw some incredible plays when it came to top cut, when it came to day number one of the women's tournament. There's so many amazing moments that stick out in my head. And it's all thanks to the incredible players and the incredible people that we had involved for the women's tournament. Yeah, so shout out again to all the mods, all the tech people behind the scenes. Victory Road for hosting this amazing stream. Top Cut Events for giving us amazing prizes that we can now give to Elisa and Mogar. Uh, you know, those plushies like you mentioned, uh, all those other amazing Pokemon trinkets that I wish I had more room for in my apartment. <laughs> um, but seriously, thank you to everybody who's been involved in the women's tournament in some way, shape or form. I think I mentioned this last time around, but I'll say it again. You know, 
being a part of a tournament like this that is just so welcoming to everybody in the community and giving people a safe space to try out competition to see if it's something that they want to do to improve um, is really, uh, really special. So thank you to all of you who made this happen. I cannot say that enough. Thank you to chat. Thank you to yeah, everybody that to watched. Chat. Thank you uh, your, for those your frogs. Your coffee pastas were fantastic. I <laughs> am now known as a commentator. Thank you very much for that. I think You're that welcome. might be my favorite moment <laughs> from <laughs> the tournament so far. A commentator. Oh, um, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Honestly, my favorite moment was seeing the camaraderie and the amazing togetherness that the community has pulled for uh, to make this event happen. It means a lot as a woman in the space uh, to have a platform to talk yeah. about these things, as well as to have an audience that really respects that. Um, and so thank you so much to everybody involved. Twitch chat, you guys were incredible. You guys were very respectful. Um, and, and thank you so much for making this tournament the best that it could be. Yeah, I, I think that you and I can say if, if a community like this was present back in 2014, 2015, um, I, I feel like I probably would have made a bit more of a run at being actually competitive at this game. Um, it's it's incredible what uh, the kind of support having this uh, really does bring. So I'm just going to echo everything you said and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you yeah. so much. Well, before crying, we ramble so. on too much about how we love you all so very much and we love everybody involved in this process, I think we should go ahead and close out the stream here. Elisa, congratulations once again for becoming the winner of the second women's tournament. Congratulations to Mal Gumpy, our runner-up. Congratulations to all of our players that made top eight, top cut, that even just played in the tournament this weekend. It takes a lot of courage to just do that. And for a lot of people, it was their very first time. So we're glad that you chose the women's tournament to make that possible. But for everybody behind the women's tournament too, the team, the production, and of course you all at home. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you all next time.